Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another masterclass by LNOD Roundtable. Today, we are speaking about inspiration through Rural Dialogues, anchored by Adil Malia. Um, before we go ahead, a few hygiene, um, just a few hygiene announcements. In the interest of learning, we'll be keeping your mics and your cameras off. However, please do keep the chat box vibrant. Post your, que your, your questions, your comments, anything that you would like to add to this conversation conversation on the chat box. There's also a Q&A box, which is specifically for questions. Do use it very actively. Post Adil's session, we'll be taking all the questions and comments. For those of you who are joining us recently, as is our usual tradition, just a very quick, very quick and a brief introduction about LNOD Roundtable and um, a few announcements about our upcoming programs. I'm repeating once again, because we have had a few people join in in last minute or so. In the interest of learning, all of your mics and videos will be switched off. However, please do keep the chat box vibrant, post your comments, your thoughts, any anecdotes that you can connect to, do share it with all of us. Do keep the Q&A box uh, active with your questions. So going, um, moving forward, introducing you to the LNOD Roundtable. LNOD Roundtable is a movement that started about 10 years ago, wherein this forum was created to help organizations and professionals drive change that would, that would deliver business impact. As we, have to, as we speak today, we have over 25,000 members and over time, the forum has evolved from having learning and HR professionals to having academicians, researchers, CXOs, CIOs who are, who are interested in driving change across the organization. This is our governing council, the wind below our wings. We have Dr. Akil Basrai from Akil Basrai Consulting, Adil Malia from the firm who is also holding the session today, Rajesh Varupadhyay, who is the director of Par Excellence, Rajesh Kamath, who, who um, runs Chanakya Consulting and very often does sessions for the forum on wisdom, mm -hmm. on wisdom from ancient Indian traditions, Dr. Sujaya Banerjee, who is the founder of the LNOD Roundtable, and CEO of Capstone People Consulting, Rajesh Padmanabhan, the founder and CEO of Televi Business Consultants, and finally Manu Vadha, CHR of Sony Pictures. Just to let you know about a few upcoming events, we have a series of four sessions by Rajesh Kamath starting 26th August on Wisdom Sutras. Do reach out to the team, do uh, write to us on our email ID should you want to know more and register. Um, the next session that we have upcoming very soon, which is on 27th August, is boosting employee experience through integrated HR technology. This is especially useful for organizations that have um, employee strength of about 200 to 500 people. We are posting the registration link for this session in, your, in the chat box. Do register. We have a very, very illustrious panel. As you can see, we have Adil speaking on this session. We have Risha Saini, Vasudevan. Vignesh, so do join us on 27th. And now coming back to the, to the theme for today, which is inspiration through rural dialogues, anchored by Adil, who is, who apart from being on our governing council is of course a well-known industry professional. So I would um, now hand it over to him to take the session ahead. Over to you, Adil. So thank you very much, Rupali, for the very happy introduction. Uh, such a pleasure and uh, thank you LNOD for once again giving me this opportunity to be with our uh, so many participants who are interested in going through this session. Uh, what is very important is that, you know, uh, the success and this is based on my experience of last so many years that I'm talking about. When you look at successful leaders and not so successful leaders, and you try to find out as to what is it that makes someone successful and what is it that doesn't make the other person uh, as successful, though they may both have come from the same set of colleges taught by the same professors reading possibly the same books. And yet one becomes successful in the operating world as a, a leader and the other does not succeed. The difference really comes not in the knowledge and the managerial style, but in the esoteric, the esoteric leadership style that makes the cutting edge difference between a successful leader and a not so successful leader. I run a series of, uh, you know, sessions on uh, 
uh, on esoteric leadership and which has eight modules to it. And uh, at that point of time, we talk about various themes. So for this particular LNOD roundtable set of four sessions, we are taking out, we are kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, carving out critical elements to be able to share with you so that you understand the concept of esoteric leadership that makes a difference uh, between winning and not winning uh, for a leader. Uh, let us begin by saying that what do I really believe uh, is uh, uh, inspirational leadership? So it is that magical stimulation that one spark, that medical stimulation that makes a guy who otherwise thinks that things are not going to be possible for him to derive, things are going to come in the way, doesn't feel confident, doesn't want to stretch. And then he gets one little spark, one little handhold, one little hug, one little thought, one little that something that suddenly, magically makes him get up and fly and break the barriers that he is saying to be able to then succeed and do what he wants to do. And that is very, very important. Now there is good news and there is bad news. Good news is that we believe inspiration is something that we learn from great people. All right, so there is this great people influence that we think about that inspiration comes to us from the great people. So the good news is that, you know, we look back at stories like, we look back at Lord Krishna talking to Arjuna, uh, in the Kurukshetra and we believe, oh God, that is such a magical thing. But what if at that point of time, the magical inspiration would still not have succeeded and Arjuna would have not gone into the action of war, but would have said fantastic things you tell me, Lord Krishna, but I still love my family. I don't want to fight the battle. So, you know, it is something that finally has to be linked to the action that is being driven and successful inspirational leaders have done that. So Lord Krishna, uh, inspiring resource. Uh, look at Gandhiji inspiring an entire nation to be able to fight against the mighty British. And that inspiration is something, and, and, and that is very important. We look at Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, who was inspiring a handful of uh, Indian army to be able to battle and fight with the massive British army. That's inspiration, right? And we looked upon such great people. Uh, look at Shivaji Maharaj. He was inspiring at a point of time, a handful of guerrilla warfare warriors and soldiers to be able to take on to the massive army of Aurangzeb. Lots of these kind of examples. So we grew up and, and you know, you and I uh, as children may have grown up in houses where we used to put photo frames of these great gods and leaders and all of that, because we always believe that, you know, these are the kind of inspirational leaders and their possible uh, aura present in our house would influence us to do things. So we believe that that is very, very important. Influence comes from such kind of great people. That's the good news. What is the bad news? The bad news is that as a conclusion of looking at these iconic people being the sources of inspiration has created a certain kind of a misunderstanding that it is a, a, a material, it is a behavior which only great people can do. So unless you are that great man in the wall, unless there is this wall hanging, unless there is this fantastic frame, it is not something that normal human beings can do. It is not something that uh, you and I can do, Gandhiji can do, uh, Lord Krishna can do, uh, uh, Netaji can do, but you and I are not in that league. And therefore we look upon inspirational as a valued uh, spiritual portion, but not something that I can achieve because I'm not in the same league and class as this great man. So we alienate ourselves from this idea of inspiration. Today, we want to talk about how it is very, very critical, particularly when we look at the kind of changes happening. How do we bring in this element of inspiration on the breathing tracks of life and in the breathing tracks of organization where life is happening in the year and now where sales people are driving sales forces, HR people are driving people and leadership. The finance guys are driving the bankers to give funding in times when there is financial liquidity crunch and those kinds of situations which require a certain element of inspiration for people to work despite all kinds of critical challenges. That is when inspiration is most required. 
And if leaders unfortunately start believing that inspiration is something which is a spirit of the gods, the spirit of the great men in the frame, I can't inspire, then that is where the mistake is that we are trying to differentiate. And which is why I say the quotient that makes an, um, that segregates and separates an effective leader from a not so effective leader is the esoteric leadership and inspiration is the essence of esoteric leadership, which is one of the most important items that we are talking about. In fact, the, it is much more critical as you will see and what we have experienced in the last one year or two years nearly now with the COVID times that leadership has actually not played the kind of role because even leadership was aghast, having not experienced the kind of situation, even leadership was aghast as what they are expected to do. And people down the line who were equally blinded by the realities were looking forward to leadership providing that inspirational element to fight back. And that never really came in most of the organizations. Clerical managerial efficiencies did come up and show up, but the inspirational leadership which was required was grossly missing. I wouldn't say missing everywhere. Some organizations and some leaders did show their inspirational skills. So we need to understand that if that is what makes people succeed, what is inspiration? And at the end of the session, we should be able to go and say that, look, if I have to as a leader and so there are two things. Number one, I as a person need inspiration because even I have to cross the barriers that come across me and I need inspiration from my leaders or the people I look up to. At the same time, when I am positioned in the role of a leader, what is it that I need to do to provide inspiration to the people out there who are looking up to me to be that leader who will inspire them to break through the firewalls and walk through it, to be able to succeed through those unseen, confusing uh, domains which block my way to success. And that is very, very important. So we come back to the breathing uh, uh, elements and, uh, you know, and I'm going to be talking about uh, taking the idea further on. And if you were to mathematically put this whole idea, that if we were to look at the success of a leader, and create a mathematical formula. That's the kind of formula I would write, which says function of successful leadership is an outcome of efficiency and effectiveness. All right. So there is something and then most people confuse uh, between efficiency and effectiveness. And it is only when you're able to segregate, not with the knife of a butcher, but with the scalpel of a surgeon, make that little fine cut with the scalpel of a surgeon and differentiate between efficiency and effectiveness, you will be able to understand the quintessence of inspiration. So success important is for you to understand is a function and a combination of efficiency, but the role of effectiveness is such that it is efficiency times effectiveness. So if Efficiency is one quantum, effectiveness makes it multiply and the multiplier effect of being effective gives you that results. That is very important. The next doodle, and these are all doodles. And as I told you last time, these doodles have appeared on the social media, which I've posted at different points of time. Whilst I'm talking about uh, esoteric leadership and inspiration, I'm bringing and culling out all of these to be able to draw a narrative for you so that you will understand the theme. So these have been culled and brought together to be able to tell my story in a kind of a session masterclass format. Now, as I told you, what is the difference? Let me explain between efficiency and effectiveness. All right. So efficiency is something which gives you the best results with optimum utilization of resources and full utilization of the process which has been put in place. So every leader, every manager in the organization has certain resources, has certain processes. He's supposed to use the, uh, the resources. He's supposed to uh, make full use of the processes and give the organization complete and maximum output out of that 
the more efficient you are the more closer you come to giving the full output therefore efficiency is an outcome of managerial uh, uh, no 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 uh, efficiency is a concept of managerial excellence it helps you to get maximum results with optimum utilization of the resources and processes that you have in hand all right so each one of us in our role has certain managerial components which we have to certainly provide because that's the fundamental to what it is but you cannot go beyond that because you have done maximum utilization of the processes and resources for that you need effective uh, efficient managers now comes a situation to explain what is effectiveness effectiveness is when the results go much beyond the target beyond that maximum level which was not possible in efficiency there comes a position in effectiveness where with, with total no use of additional processes or no use of additional resources the leader by using his skill sets the leader by using his effectiveness the leader by using his esoteric leadership skills is able to influence outcome far beyond what capacity excellence was able to give so a manager is required for purposes of efficiency an inspirational leader is required for creating effectiveness so that the organization is able to achieve much higher than what its resources and processes could otherwise achieve and that is the difference between uh, effectiveness and efficiency what does the organization require actually it requires both you know uh, unfortunately in business schools and one sees in a lot of management literature manager versus leader manager is everything not so desirable leader is everything that is so desirable uh, manager is everything that's black leader is everything that's shining gold all right so that kind of a bipolar differentiation between manager and leader is absolutely in my understanding my little understanding of what i understand of management is erroneous what is real is that in an organizational reality you require both kind of people existing in that one person who is handling the role for the organization he needs to be an efficient manager so that he uses the resources and processes to its maximum levels and then after he reaches his levels of efficiency he has to provide effectiveness to be able to provide results from his people evoke that spark evoke that inner spirit evoke that inner passion to go much beyond what resources and processes can achieve by believing the leader and what he wants to achieve and therefore the esoteric leader using his inspirational skills is able to influence people to go much higher to stretch to jump to break that one minute mile kind of a challenge so that the organization succeeds and the people in the organization become very very happy that's very very important all right now look at this so inspiration is about evoking that enthusiasm in people so number one is people after being efficient are left at that happy that we have used our resources well we have completed all our processes well we have achieved the target now what should enthuse them so inspiration is about evoking that enthusiasm in the people to do and achieve those extra ordinary which ordinary people can do efficiencies but to go and achieve that extra ordinary things which they would otherwise never imagine they could do or venture out to achieve in a tight degree of difficulty or past experiences of failure you keep failing over a period of time sometimes and you don't know you don't want to try you feel frustrated you say what the hell is happening why should i try again three times i have failed now you require a different evocation of enthusiasm and that is why inspiration is required and you as a leader when you see that happening in your team or if you as a person are experiencing that then you expect from your leader that element of inspiration 
to be able to tide over those challenges which are otherwise frustrating in that organization. So what do you see in the doodle? Let's look at the doodle. The doodle is showing that there are these two guys who have to cross the wall that is created, unable to do that, they are failing. The first time the guy with the red is breaking his head, again, hitting the wall. The guy with another blue trousers is also hitting the wall. So here is a leader who says, come walk with me, hold my hand, and is going to help the other guy in the sky blue trousers walk along with him holding his hand to be able to cross the barrier, which others have not been able to, and even he would not have been able to, had the leader not been inspiring, had the leader not been talking, had the leader not been getting into him. And you see the smile on his face with ease he is walking to be able to cross the barrier, which otherwise would have been a blockage to his fulfillment, happiness, and flourish. All right, so uh, you need to understand as to what is the role. Now, there are two kinds of leaders. Most people don't know. Uh, everyone has heard of toxic leaders, but most people in the language don't know. What is the opposite of a toxic leader? Toxic, we all understand. So if there was a opposite of that, what is it? The opposite of toxic is palliative. The word is palliative. And we are so unused to it that we don't even know the word exists. And I'll explain to you what it means. But let me just for reiteration, because we are all so familiar, the moment I say toxic leader, each one of us must have had some five images coming into our heads of people who we have experienced being uh, uh, toxic leaders, all right? So that we would have experienced, but let us uh, read through the doodle and say, what is it saying about uh, who is a toxic leader, all right? A toxic leader is, Puerile, he demotivates. His presence, he is actually contra to the purpose of his existence. Whilst he should have been helpful, actually he is causing a negative impact on the people as a consequence of which the people feel demotivated. The enthusiasm that whatever little they had on their own self-created enthusiasm is killed because they don't feel encouraged. And either of his arising out of his own insecurity, his own jealousies, his own pettiness, or his own power neurosis, he does not allow the people under him to grow, he is toxic, and therefore uh, he does not succeed. As compared to that, there is something called the palliative leader, all right? Now, what is a palliative leader? A palliative leader is an inspirational leader, and he motivates others to be enthusiastic. So he does not say, I'm going to uh, break the mangoes from the tree. He's saying, no, I'm not going to do that. You are supposed to break that mango from the tree and eat for yourself, but I am going to enthuse you so that just because you threw 10 stones and you could not break the mango, don't stop throwing the 11th and the 12th and the 13th stone, or I will teach you in how to achieve success in a much different way or how to throw the stones in a much different way. I am going to enthuse you. I'm going to coach you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to provide support to you. I'm going to do everything to make you succeed in achieving the heights and fulfill the challenges purely on the basis of my confidence and security. I will provide you security if you fall. I'm going to uh, give you that confidence. I believe you can do it. And therefore, don't let your frustrations eat into you. He inspires. Very critical word to remember in the leadership dictionary, which most people have not even heard. Palliative leadership is a reflection of esoteric leaders in the world across. And you will find numbers of them. When I talk about palliative leaders, as much as I spoke about toxic leaders, we could recreate very quickly in the flashbacks of our mind, five toxic leaders who we wanted to recall. But if I ask how many palliative leaders you remember, possibly one, possibly none. Some of you may be blank. Do we, have I ever worked under a palliative leader? Questions will come to your mind. And therefore, the world needs more and more of a palliative leader. Actually, the world needs you to be the palliative leader. That's very important because everybody now in his mind believes toxic leader is someone I hate. 
I am a palliative leader. Now, unfortunately, that may be the reverse uh, situation. If you ask that other guy, are you a toxic leader? And he will say, no, I am a palliative leader and this guy is a toxic leader. So who are you in your leadership style? Do we need an external assessment or do you need serious self-introspection to be able to determine if your style, if the way in which you are working, the mental scripts that you have written with, the transactional codes that you operate internally with, are these codes palliative codes or are these toxic codes which make your external behavior with people toxic or palliative? And that's very important. Now, very funny, around two years ago, and I'm talking about prior to COVID, uh, we had done this little study with students from this. And at that point of time, we asked people to identify themselves with a series of questions on what did they believe they were palliative or toxic leaders. So it was called the PT scale, that is the palliative toxic scale. And we found that senior leaders who scored higher than 80%, who scored higher than 80% on this scale, were supposed to be palliative because they were as high as 80% and they were palliative up to that extent. So we found that 22% participants in the universe of 200 participants, 22% participants believed that they were palliative leaders, 22%, all right? Now I'm going to tell you the big joke and big surprising news is, then we actually conducted a survey with the people who were reporting to these 22% people, all right? So these 22% people who said they were high palliative leaders, we conducted a similar survey to find out a 360 feedback of these 22 people from their direct reports. And do you know what we found? And the way I'm asking is, I'm surely putting it in a rhetoric way so you can imagine what the guess is. 73% direct reports of these 22% palliative leaders actually said that their leaders were autocratic, not listening at all, poor communicators, and above all, absolutely political and self-opinionated. Now, can you explain how this happens when a leader believes himself to be a palliative leader, but his direct reports on a 360 actually believe he's a mega uh, uh, toxic leader. And therefore, rather than only mentally understanding the difference between the two, it is necessary that each one of us do a serious self-introspection Maybe speak to the people, maybe speak to your coach, maybe speak to your guru, maybe speak to your best friend, maybe speak to your team and try and find out as to how do they look at you. And that would be the first beginning of your journey to do a self-screening and on the basis of which you can start putting forward the rectificatory designs of your script to make yourself a palliative leader. But very important that you should become a palliative leader rather than a toxic leader. No one believes he's a toxic leader, though most of them are. Now, if you look at the Greek mythology, and some of you may have read, there is a very beautiful duopoly between Demon, as we understand, and Daemon. So it's a battle between Daemon and Demon. And the battle is that uh, Damon is the benevolent noble spirit. And he is available throughout in uh, uh, Greek mythology. If you will open our books on Greek mythology, you will find the positive role of the Damon. All right. When you experience him to be in charge, says, you know, the, uh, the, the, the great poet Rudyard Kipling, when you experience uh, uh, Damon, the positive one, Consciously drift, wait, and just obey because he is going to drive you to the right point. All right. You may not be like him, but if you experience a daemon, just follow him because he's going to be, you'll be inspired by him. Okay. And to manage and balance the daemon, there is an equivalent called demon. As we understand, we use the word demon very well, but we have not heard of this character called daemon. Uh, demon creates insecurities infuses aversion and action. Damon seeks movement and progress. Damon loves to be static 
and halts all kinds of progress. Now it is upon you to decide what you would like to do. We are going to talk about esoteric leadership, which recommends that you follow the pattern of daemon and not demon, or as we have understood, not. In fact, Zoroastrian uh, philosophy also has this entire, uh, uh, you know, duopoly between uh, uh, angry menu and spent the menu, the two negative and the positive forces counterplaying each other to bring around goodness in the world. But that we will talk at a later point of time. What do inspirational leaders do? All right. So what do they do? Why is that role so important? And let's talk, let's, let's run through some of the things they do, because once we understand what do they do, it is not an unknown element, it is an observable element. And if it is an observable, measurable element, the question remains, how do we ourselves reflect these behaviors? And that is very important. All right. So inspirational leaders connect people to the strategic vision of the enterprise and motivates self-belief and enhances connection and engagement. So number one is the larger purpose of the organization should not look so alienated to the person who's playing a role in the organization to believe, to look up and say, you know, yes, they are saying some vision statement. They want to achieve something, but I don't know what my role is. I am just a clerical staff. I am just an engineer. What do I have? This must be a nice thing that they have written and made a lovely frame. And the chairman has put that frame behind his room. Is the sign of a toxic leader. A toxic leader has not communicated to his team as to what is the linkage between what the person and his role is and how does that role connect to the larger strategic purpose of the enterprise or organization he is working for. And this does not have to be only commercial organization. It can be any organization because all organizations exist for their purpose. Therefore, a Palliative leader identifies the purpose and handholds the individual role players to say, you are playing a very, very important role. And the purpose of our organization is not going to be fulfilled if you don't play your role well. And let me show you how your role is critical. He links that role to the larger strategic vision of the enterprise. And that is what makes the difference. That is what creates a motivation because it now makes the person down the line believe I am important. Haven't we heard of the story that when you tell a bricklayer that he is laying bricks, he is not going to be motivated. But when you are able to show the bricklayer that actually he is laying the brick, but the consequence of that brick laying is to build that beautiful church and he is contributing to creating a beautiful house for the Lord. The motivation of the bricklayer is different than when he doesn't know why he is laying the brick or what is the contribution he is making to the larger pool. So number one, motivation. Number two is he is connected to the larger purpose and thus whatever he does, he feels very engaged. And that is what an inspirational leader does. Inspirational leader is not a magician who's staying, uh, you know, standing on a stage and, uh, you know, bringing out rabbits from uh, his hat or something of that kind. These are real things. Can you do it in your organization? If you are a positive leader, it is not difficult for you to understand the purpose, understand what the guy is doing, talk to him, communicate to him, don't think he's a fool who will not understand the purpose, understand that he has got uh, relational needs, he has got emotional needs, he has got capabilities, and he has got ability to understand what he is doing, how it links to the larger purpose. That is what a leader does, an inspirational leader is actually someone who connects and engages with an intention to motivate and fulfill the purpose of the organization through the people. That's number one. He empowers people at all levels to foster drive. Political leaders never share power. They are so power corrupt that they don't want to share power because of their insecurities. They believe that if I share my power, I will be left with none. But what is important is the moment an inspirational leader shares power, his power increases. He is able to show better results 
as compared to a toxic leader who is not inspiring his people, who is not empowering his people, who is just giving directions and telling people, don't ask too many questions. Just do what I'm telling you. I just want your pair of hands. I don't want your thinking. I don't want your feelings. Those are things which are alien to you. Maybe you will uh, get those values out of reading spiritual books. But when you come to the organization, come with a solid pair of hands. Don't bring your heart and your head to the workplace. And that is the sign of a toxic leader. And how many of you I can see without looking at the screen who must be smiling in their minds to say, that sounds like my boss. That sounds like my neighbor. That sounds like someone I know. And that is the truth because there are more and more tech toxic leaders because the world is such that it creates insecurity and positive leadership is a difficult self attempt, which people don't want to invest and make. The third thing that a positive inspirational leader, he, he does is that he accumulates the internal knowledge and shares winning stories. Now, when I tell people in my organization stories about some other company, it happens in Europe, it happens in America. The moment you will go there, is our company will not work. You can't run your own company. Why can't you run your own company? No, no, no. Our company will not work. It's a good company. It's a multinational company. It's a foreign company. It's like this in America. It's not like this in India. It's not like this. The problem is wrong because the inspirational leader does not identify the stories from within, the success stories from within the organization and shares it with the larger population of the organization to tell them that within the same challenges and within the same problems that you are facing, there are some people who are succeeding. So why can't you in the same context rather than blaming the situation and rather than blaming the context, why can't you, like these guys from within our own companies, get up, rise and achieve those higher things because that is what uh, you will succeed and that is what will make you great. This is something that an inspirational leader does. He accumulates the internal knowledge and the internal success stories and then he shares it, these winning stories with the rest of the organization. He makes heroes in the organization and, and he makes a cult around them rather than saying inspiration is something that Krishna provided in Mahabharata, Gandhiji provided in the uh, independence movement, Netaji provided whilst creating the army or Shivaji created it whilst uh, fighting with his gorilla band of warriors against Aurangzeb. No. These are winning stories from our environment, from our context, from our situation. Absolutely like you and me, these are people, but who have succeeded in breaking through the kind of barriers which are coming in your way of performance. And therefore, can hold me and I'm going to inspire you to drive over these problems and succeed. And that is what an inspirational leader does effectively. He also gathers and integrates external information and facilitates design thinking. Means whenever he sees a blockage, he is willing to talk to his people. He's willing to communicate to his people. Very important is you cannot become an inspirational leader if you do not believe in communicating. If you do not believe in developing an emotional connect with the people, you will never be an inspirational leader. To be an inspirational leader, you should be communicating, which means you should be listening. You should also be speaking because somewhere down the line, when I hear a lot of people saying, you know, communication skills is about listening skills. Well, yes, it is about listening skills, much about listening skills, but it is also about speaking skills because unless you speak, unless you tell those narrative stories, unless you speak, out and reach to people, you will not be able to build that emotional connect with your people. And therefore, if you do not believe in building that emotional connect with your people through communications, chances are you may not be uh, able to inspire people to do that extraordinary much, that cutting edge extraordinary differential between efficiency and effectiveness. And that is what an inspirational leader does. Challenges the status quo and enables creativity and innovation. I want to do it in a new way. 
toxic leader is going to say, no, if I tell you to do it in a different way, do it. If I tell you not to do it, don't do it. Remember, I told you not to bring your brains. So don't come and tell me you want to do it in a different way. I have decided you will do it in this way and that's how you will do it. Toxic. Inspirational leader actually challenges the status quo. He tells, why are you repeating and doing the same thing again and again? Aren't you tired? Aren't you uh, absolutely disgusted with the mundane? Don't you want to do the same thing in a different way? Don't you want to feel happy doing it? Because when you keep repeating to do the same thing again and again, are you going to feel motivated to go home and come back the next day to your workplace? Why don't you become creative? So the encouragement for innovation, encouragement for creativity, encouragement to do different things and achieve the same goal in different multiple ways as a result of which better results would come to the organization this is a contribution that an effective leader a palliative leader makes and a toxic leader consciously because of his insecurities will discourage people to make those kind of contributions to the organization most important is this point that a palliative leader, an inspirational leader, holds the hand and walks through the performance firewall. He does not tell people that jump when I tell you to jump. He tells them that if you have to go through trouble times, I'm going to handhold you. I'm going to be with you in your critical watershed moments so that you are provided that confidence. And after that, I'll let you walk. Of course, you have to walk on your own. Of course, you have to walk on your own. And I'm going to inspire you to walk on your own. But if I see a watershed moment where I believe you will fall and injure yourself, at that particular moment, I will come with you. I will hold your hand and we will walk together, cross that watershed moment. And then again, when there is a safe path, you walk on your own such that at one point of time, you will then develop experience of walking through these watershed moments and are able to then successfully do it on your own and as a result of which then help others to do the same thing. That is what an inspirational leader does. He makes leaders out of his followers and tells them to generate more and more new leaders in the organization through his inspiration by not only telling him to walk, but giving him an element, uh, an element of comfort and security in the watershed moments and then allows him to experience walking by himself such that he becomes an influencing leader, an inspiring leader who will inspire other leaders to become similar to him and pass the chain of inspiration down the organization. What do you think the toxic leader says? The toxic leader saying, hold your hands? What nonsense. I am the leader. I know what to do. When I tell you to jump, don't ask me where or what. Just ask me how high and I will tell you how high you should jump because I am the champion. I am the master and you do it. Well, if you fall, we will see what to do with your injury. Possibly we will send you to an hospital or whatever, but jump you must. That is how a toxic leader looks. As a consequence of which, People do not wish to experiment under a toxic leader. They do not want to do innovative ways. They do not want to indulge in innovation. They do not want to use their creativity because they are sure that the existing way has been proven to give results. So why want to risk that happiness? Continue to do the way they are doing because failure will be fraught with consequences which you do not want to experiment. So why should I want to do it? So the organization suffers under a toxic leader and grows to its fulfillment under a palliative leader because a palliative leader influences people who are following him to not follow him, but to become leaders by themselves and pass on the influencing chain of becoming inspirational leaders also to his followers. That is critical to know. Three characters you will see constantly emerging as what are the characteristics of an inspirational leader? Number one, let me tell you, uh, as I'm doing this entire series of four programs, uh, esoteric leadership comprises of eight elements. And I'm not here to talk about all eight elements. I'll give you some light flavors of four elements right of now. And those are the aims uh, flavorings. 
So the number one we spoke about last week is authenticity. Today we are speaking about inspiration. Next time we are going to speak about mindfulness and the last will be on sagacity. So A-I-M-S, authenticity, inspiration, uh, mindfulness and sagacity is what we will cover here because we do not have time and we are running master classes. So it's just about giving you flavors of what esoteric leadership is about and how do you create these esoteric leaders in the organization. Number one, therefore, is unless, unless you are authentic, you cannot be inspirational. No one is going to seek inspiration from you when he believes that you are talking lies. When he believes you have never even jumped from a parachute, what about jumping from the Everest? He's telling me to jump from the Everest. He has not jumped from the bloody cupboard in his uh, drawing room. And he's telling me to do that. So unless and until people believe in your genuinity, unless and until they believe you are authentic, unless and until they know that what you are talking, you are talking sense and you're not talking only because someone has told you to get a job done. So you are pushing this other fellow to say, do the difficult job. He believes that that difficult job is what you can do, but you are influencing him to do so that he can learn how to do such kind of difficult jobs in the future and create a chain of such leaders who can jump and do their jobs well. So number one critical element is authenticity. Second is spontaneous evocation. Inspiration should not have a hidden agenda. So when a guy finds out, huh, so why is he trying to be mm, suddenly very inspirational and why is, he, uh, 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 why is he playing a bull on me? Now, the moment the people who are following you tend to see that there is a hidden agenda, you are going to as a leader benefit from something that you are making him do and it is not him who is going to benefit. If he does not see that spontaneous evocation, he will not be inspired by you. However, you may want to garb as a toxic leader all your decisions, all your actions, as if you are a palliative. A toxic leader always pretends to be a palliative leader. Remember that, all right? So that's our external garb. All toxic leaders wear. The important thing is your toxicity can immediately be perceived by people under you. And therefore, it is spontaneous evocation without hidden agenda that makes the followers believe you are palliative or toxic. So palliative or toxic leadership is not a self-given title that you can give yourself. Your followers give you that title because they experience you and therefore they decide whether you are toxic or palliative. It is transcendental, very abstract, but very vision defining <clears throat> and it appears supernatural, sublime, but it is actually actionable. And therefore that transcendental component as a characteristic of a palliative leader is what makes him inspiring. And it is very contagious. When you see an inspirational leader uh, do his job, I promise you, he does it such that within minutes of transacting with this guy, you believe you want to work with him because he can make you rise and make you achieve and make you do those bigger things in life which you never thought you could do. And it is at this point of time he starts getting inspired that inner enthusiasm is evoked and you start achieving those big things which you yourself could never imagine you could achieve. That is what a characteristic of an authentic leader all about, an inspiring leader all about. And this is my definition. What you see on the screen on the doodle is my inspiration. What, do, what does inspiration mean to me? So inspiration means to me that flash of a thought that triggers the change. It doesn't come with a history. You know, it's not a long journey of inspiration. It comes like a spark. It comes like a flash. It triggers the change in me, which I was waiting for, without which I could not make the difference. But that change has happened because one spark has happened. I have seen something. I met someone. I heard someone. I saw this leader pushing someone in which I want to be. So it is that flash of a thought that triggers the change 
and sparks the fire within you to take the desired flight. You were not taking that flight. You were not doing the thing that you wanted to do. But there is this one particular moment in which it triggered off. And you decided you are not going to stay there or you are going to do that what was frustrating you or not moving you or you were procrastinating. But now you have found the reason to do it. That is what inspiration is all about. Inspiration is not necessarily about a person. It can be about an event as well. It can be about an animal as well. We have all heard the story of Jonathan Livingston Seagull, right? Now, most people believe that Jonathan Livingston Seagull is the name of a person who authored this. Most people believe this wrongly. Sorry, the original author of this book is Richard Bach. And most of you may have read it, but forgotten that. Jonathan Livingston is the name he gives to a particular seagull who he saw in keen observation doing things about how he was breaking through his pack and doing things which he was not supposed to do, but he was doing it because he wanted to do it. And as a result of which he succeeds in flying distances which other seagulls were not able to and thereafter he finds that that seagull, Jonathan Livingston Seagull as he named him, was able to make a few other seagulls join him in doing exactly what he had done earlier to fly distances which other seagulls never believed they could fly. That's inspiration. You read the story, you feel inspired. So inspiration is not necessarily something that you pick up from a human being. It is any event, any thought, any experience, any observation, any reading, any book, Ayn Rand, whoever all you may see, but that triggers the change and sparks the fire within you to take that desired flight which you were otherwise not taking is what inspiration is all about. It helps a person from apathy to focused success. Read the doodle, see the doodle. Constant failure sometimes frustrates people. Trying to do the same thing again and again, appearing for my chartered accountant exam. I made five attempts, not succeeding. I don't know what to do. Now I don't want to give my exams. I might as well remain a clerk and work in some clerical company because how long will I keep making those attempts? To succeed, a leader will have to hold hands and hands of his followers to give comfort and provide inspiration to push through the firewall and block it and reach the unreachable goal. Look at the doodle. There is this one wall which is coming in the way that is the wall of frustration. No one ever plays football or soccer with a wall and the goal on the other side. But this is this imaginary wall. This is the imaginary wall of frustrations and blockades that does not help the guy to kick his ball into his goal. And then every time he's kicking the ball is bouncing back. So you see those bouncing back arrows and then you see he gets a coach C who comes and says, let us try it in a different way. I'm going to show you how to kick this over the frustrating wall that's blocking you to achieve. And that's what goal is about. And that is what is providing inspiration all about. Holding his hand and making the guy, showing him how to do it at times, making him do it, but making him achieve that what was otherwise frustrating him is what inspiration is all about. So for any successful task to be completed, there are some psychological elements which have to be present. When these psychological elements are not present, you cannot succeed in doing the job. So it's like an enabling environment. A task can succeed or successfully be done when the enabling environment is present. But if the enabling environment becomes toxic, you cannot achieve it. Now, what are these psychological elements which need to be present? Number one, need for mastery. Number two, positive perceptions of challenges. You don't have to look at challenges negatively. So how do you create positive perception of challenges? That is an enabling environment. Optimism, one of the most important elements. Resilience, high self-esteem, and a passionate drive and a passionate drive to say, I'm going to keep hitting the 
fall till I succeed in breaking. Now, these are positive elements, psychological elements which need to be present along with the skill required to play or do the job. So the skill is important, but along with the skill, certain enabling psychological elements need to be present for a guy to feel inspired to do the job. Your job as a leader is to ensure that those psychological elements are present in him. And if not, how do you help him to tide over the challenges of toxic environmental factors which are not enabling him to succeed and tied over to be able to hit through or let the ball be hit through over the wall of frustration and meet the goal that it wants to meet. That is what is important. How to move from apathy to success. That is the agenda. How do I make my people work with their inner energy, work through their inspiration, work through their internal aura to be able to be influenced, to push through a position from apathy to success. When we run this session and we ask this question, and I'm sure if I'm going to ask you these questions, most of you might not be able to answer this question. Is there a difference between inspiring and inspiration? Inspirational? Is there a difference? Actually, there is. The difference between the two is that inspiring, when you're talking about, is more about the final effect it has on the person inspired. So how does the process work? Number one, is there is an inspirational trigger. Now, palliative leader's role is to provide that inspirational trigger because it has to initiate action, you know, action has to come out. That is the inspired action that the palliative leader has. So the first is the inspirational trigger. Inspirational trigger leads to action. Action leads to achieving super successes over things which were not imagined. And when you achieve in the post-mortem, when people look at your success and they say, what is that success due to? Then you say that that success is an outcome of, being, of an inspiring uh, uh, situation that you cross. So inspiring looks at the end result. After it is achieved, it is an inspiring outcome. But inspirational is an active act, an act before the results, which the leader inspires his people to undertake so that they do positive actions and they move. So one is focused on creating a trigger for action. Inspirational is the one that creates a trigger for action inspired or inspiring is the end result of it. Inspiring speech. I can give a speech. Very inspiring. I've not made you do anything. I have given you an inspiring speech. And you said, oh my God, what a great speaker. What an inspiring speech. All right. But more important is when tasks on the breathing tracks of the organization have to be done, when people are failing, frustration is happening, liquidity crunch is there and creditors have to be paid and I have to handle the situation. I need inspirational leaders to provide me that inspiration that influences me to take the positive actions, which will give me those extraordinary results, which will bring me success. And that success will be an outcome of inspired action. Two differences between inspiring and inspirational. Very important. Very thin line of demarcation, as I always keep saying. What should you as a leader be doing? What should a leader be doing? Should he be inspiring or should he be inspirational? I would say both. Because number one, of course, your role as an inspiring leader is to provide the inspiration which will enable or influence people to act in a certain positive way, which you want, as we discussed, right? But a leader also has to be inspiring because he should be able to, at the end of it, narrate these stories and successes of his people who have done extraordinary work and challenging circumstances, make heroes out of them so that that heroics are then narrated as tales to the people within the organization and they in return get influenced by the others to do similar kind of inspirational acts 
And therefore, as a leader, you've got to be, of course, focusing first on inspiration, but the inspiring narratives have to be also told by the leader. You have to make the heroes of the successful people. Most organizations fail in both. But more critically, we do not recognize successes of our people. Because in recognizing successes, the toxic and the insecure leader sees his failures. I was not able to do that. Had he not come in, uh, he would not have done it. He's done it without my help. He's done it without my contributions. He's done it without my involvement. My super boss is not going to believe that I have done anything and he will believe that he's far better than me. Therefore, my insecurity of losing my chair may stop me from narrating these positive stories in the organization. Uninspiring leadership. Toxic leadership. Very poor esoteric elements of leadership. And therefore, such leaders cannot in the long run survive. I can tell you on the basis of my 38 years of experience in uh, India and overseas in Indian organizations and multinational companies. Uh, I have worked in the Coca-Colas and the G's and the Marks and Spencers of the world. And I've also worked with Indian organizations and wherever. This is true. Unless, if you are a toxic leader, I promise you, your shelf life is dated at some point of time, this story is going to come to an end. At some point of time, the citadel of the toxic leader is going to collapse. And don't you follow the wrong role model of being a toxic leader. Learn how to be an inspiring leader. Very important if you want to succeed. You have to be an efficient manager. Be an efficient manager. But that is not the be all and end all because you have to get results far more than what efficiency is about. You have to use your esoteric leadership style to achieve results far higher from the same processes and resources which efficiencies were able to create but get better results through use of your inspirational skills. That is very, very important. Now, very humorously, uh, you know, I love to create anagrams. So I do it. Uh, a leader fosters inspiration in his team when he champions four things. When you see a team doing four things, when you see a team showing agility, now see the first curve of agility, all the dark blue, light blue guys climbing the rope. When there are certain situations, they are climbing. When there are certain situations, they are going down. When there are vertical situations, they are climbing. When there are uh, other situations, they are hanging. So the Agility of the situation or agility of the response to a challenge in a situation, when you see that agility shown very easily without being pushed, you can certainly believe that the team is being led by an inspirational leader because unless there's an inspirational leader, the team will not be willing to do all these kinds of gymnastics depending on the situations and context. When they do it very fast, sharp, agile movements, it is an indication that the team is being led by an efficient leader. The second is drive. We identify purposes in organizations. We engage uh, professional consultants, some of them like me, most not, of course. I want to jocularly say that. But organizations put in energy to define their purposes, define their vision statements. What do they do after that? They believe they make those fancy booklets and they do some couple of communication sessions or make those wonderful wall or every presentation of the leader is uh, you know, covered by the first slide which reads out the vision statement. That's not really putting the vision into action. The, the critical role after that is to anchor the passionate drive of the people by showing them meaningful roles they perform to achieve this purpose and therefore an inspiring leader creates a passionate drive to reach the purpose in the minds and hearts of the people in the mindsets and the heart sets of the people he drives that passion to be able to achieve the purpose that is very critical therefore number two is when you see that kind of a mad drive, they fall and they get up and they again want to do it. You can believe that there is an inspirational leader up there. 
when you see a lot of new innovations happening and you can see the uh, the, uh, the lower end of the doodle where you see a lot of innovations happening you can jolly well believe there is an inspiring leader because if a toxic leader is going to punish failures no one is going to be innovative so if you see a lot of innovations happening you can imagine that the organization is being led by an inspiring leader at the same time if you say this organization is a problem we are doing the same thing for last 50 years and no one wants to find another way of doing it first diagnose that the leadership is toxic non enthusiastic intellectually at a stage of intellectual menopause not able to create anything further that is the situation immediately you can make out whether the top leader is inspiring or he is toxic whether he is palliative or toxic you can make out and the last is is he creating a learning environment considering the knowledge is outdating at a very very fast pace is the organization focusing on building new capabilities are we working on building the digital capabilities in the given context are we finding out ways to handle adversities in a far better way in the given context are we building those organizational capabilities if that is what an organization is doing you can safely assume that the organization is led by an influential positive inspiring leader but if you see that after the pandemic is over they say okay fine imagine that there was a large vacation of around one and a half years now start doing from where you left it and continue doing what you were doing even in the new times how does it bother us we will continue to do the way we are doing you can safely assume that that leadership is going to crash because it is a non inspiring leadership it is a toxic leadership now coincidentally i am going to give you an anagram which you will which will help you to remember this remember my name as i keep saying my name is adil a d i l which now you can connect to the anagram and say agility drive innovation and learning the criticalities of change and success which an inspiring leader is able to infuse in his organization for easy learning use the anagram agility drive innovation learning and remember other the doodle will help you to do that uh let's look at what actually an inspirational leader doing as i finally told you and i was talking about it in the beginning that what if in the mahabharata lord krishna was giving his very uh, you know uh, uh, inspirational trigger to arjuna and saying you know there is a dharma you have to perform and so what if this is your family the dharma demands that you fight them etc it is a very very i must have read that uh, you know book uh, at least five times in my life very inspirational uh, uh, book uh, bhagavad gita now what if imagine this what if if after the entire discourse that krishna gives to arjuna if arjuna turned around and said yeah sounds very interesting very positive but you know i love my family i love duryodhana uh, i i love uh, all the other guys you know my father is blind he is also an uncle of mine and i don't want to fight why should i fight for it what would have happened but why is this considered an inspirational moment because at a very critical point at a junction where action or inaction was fighting the battle to go ahead on go backwards the inspirational trigger led to a confused mind taking a decision in a positive direction to go and fight the battle initiated to action in the right direction therefore action is very very critical indicator of inspiration now that doesn't mean that if the action is taken and you fail once it means inspiration is bad there are other ways of, but are you encouraging are you inspiring people to take action again after they fail as we said resilience is about that so action and resilience in case of failure with a passionate drive for purpose is very important action is important and therefore a very important second anagram and this is not what i am trying to put it with you as any element of narcissism as much as it is for your ability to recall remember my last name my last name is malia m a l i a now if you remember anagram it to say most admirable leaders inspire action most 
admirable leaders inspire action. And if there is no action, you can believe that inspiration is missing in a big way. So organizations have to drive agility, drive passionately, focus on innovation and create a learning capability environment. And most of all, the leaders should be inspiring to make people inspire and take necessary action. As you see in the doodle, the doodle is up there. You can read it uh, to your heart's content. What if there is an inspirational deficiency? You have employed a high cost employee in your organization and a capable guy has all the degrees you want, has got everything else. Uh, what would he be able to do? Now, inspiration leads people from apathy to possibility. So here, if you ever employ a man who has inspirational deficiency, is not getting inspired to do anything despite of all the attempts, then the chances are that behind every opportunity that he will be looking for his organization, he will be procrastinating to apathy and not taking any action because that is how he is trained and used to seeing. Therefore, the moment you realize that all likely attempts to inspire the person has been taken and you have done five times, you've been resilient in your providing inspiration and yet the guy is going to be uninspired. And what is the phrase? Flogging a dead horse. You can keep flogging him, but you can never make him the horse which can run a race. Therefore, a, a, a inspiration deficient leader uh, makes all positive possibilities into apathy. He does exactly the reverse. Instead of converting apathy into possibility, he converts possibility into apathy. There is always a problem in everything because he sees the whole and he does not see the donut. Unfortunately, that is what happens. Confidence with stretch, which inspiration provides, a deficient person, deficient in inspiration, converts even goals which were possible on a reasonable stretch into impossibilities. Even if you were to say a little bit of more stretch would make you achieve something, this guy converts to say, even if I do that little stretch, actually I will go backwards instead of going forwards. He is not aligned emotional. He is not aligned while doing the task. He is not aligned with his emotional, spiritual, and cognitive. The three elements which need to come together for any successful job to be done. A person deficient in inspiration is unable to do that. And therefore, his alignment becomes a major problem. His mind may tell him, yes, I can do it. But his emotions may tell him no. Or his spiritual values may say, no, 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 I can't do it. I'm not used to doing it. Whatever. But such a person is like a dead horse. You may keep flogging him, but he will not act. And he ultimately reflects an action bias. Gives you fantastic speeches. Uh, I was uh, doing a consulting assignment with an organization where people are working for God knows how many years in that company. But there is a tremendous action bias behind every project that they are evaluating. They can only see a problem as a result of which in the last three years, not a single project evaluated has been taken forward because in every possible project, they can only see the problems. They can only look at the stones and the pebbles. They can never see the stars in the skies as a result of which the organization is taking a downslide. So when you diagnose your organization and you find people uh, with deficient aspiration and if you put in enough amount of energy to drive them and they yet don't show you the results, it is time sometimes to indulge in surgery after medication fails because that will be good for the guy and will be good for the organization and you will create a happy organization of the future. Very important. Inspirational leaders have three qualities. And as you will look at the doodle, number one, they walk the talk. Of course, as I told you, I can only talk, but I can't walk it. I can myself do it. I can't demonstrate it. An inspirational leader, number one, should be able to demonstrate everything that he's telling people to do. I can do it myself. I can do and show you how I'm doing it. So you jump. So it means if you can't jump 16 feet, 
I will jump 16 feet and show you it is possible. Now I'll help you and hold you and show you how you can jump 16 feet is what he does. So he walks the talk. He has to walk the talk. He can't be a leader if he doesn't walk the talk. He motivates for action. Sri Krishna's uh, example, uh, Netaji's example, Gandhiji's example, Shivaji Maharaj's example, where you motivate action. If I keep giving fantastic speeches, and if my purpose is to give a speech and believe that what you will do, you will do better, that is not uh, inspiration. Inspiration is something that will finally be measured on the breathing track of action. On the living track of action, on the breathing tracks of action, is the person influenced to act in a positive way. That is the test of inspiration. So an inspirational leader's one quality is he motivates for action. And he role models by actual roles performed to learn from. So he identifies others as well. Because if I show only myself, you may say, oh, yeah, actually, you know, you are a superhero. You are a super leader, whatever, whatever. I can't be like you. You know, you are God's gift to mankind. Makes me feel very happy. But he won't do it. So he goes around identifying others in the organization who have successfully done it to give him an element of confidence that not only me, not only the, you can't do it, but there are many other people who couldn't do it, but we helped them to jump. Hold my hand and I'm going to make you jump. That is inspiration. Spiritual leaders need to be therefore distinguished from uh, inspirational leaders. All right. Because one is going uh, and giving only a spiritual gyan. He motivates you. He tells you about the universe. He tells you about spirit, uh, you know, how to succeed. What are five fantastic ways to succeed in life? He's in himself never run the organization. I get to see a lot of these leaders and particularly in this times when webinars on webinars and masterclasses on masterclasses are run on management themes, you find that people who have not even performed their roles, who did not even have the opportunity to perform those roles, ultimately go around doing those kinds of inspirational speeches. And that actually becomes just spiritual motivation, which has no meaning because you cannot demonstrate your own actions in the same space as you give your thoughts where you have done actions that you want. All right. The point where the three get mixed up is this, that we sometimes mix up spiritual motivational speakers as inspirational leaders. And unless you differentiate between the two, you will not be able to differentiate who should you be following and who you should not be following. This is my last favorite slide in which I had uh, uh, possibly uh, uh, learned as a story when I was possibly in class four or class five or whatever it is. Incidentally, sorry, uh, forgive me for the poor quality of my drawing. As I keep saying in doodling, you need to uh, importantly understand that a doodle is not a piece of art, right? I'm not an artist artist, all right? If you want to see art, please go to Jangir Art Gallery. This is supposed to be indicating the spirit of what the doodle and the thought is. So this is supposed to be Mahatma Gandhi. Please believe and imagine he's Mahatma Gandhi if he doesn't look like. So I'm told that Mahatma Gandhi ji was in South Africa at a point of time. And when he was working on some of his missions out there, there was a lady who approached him and said, Gandhi ji, I want you to talk to my son. He is misbehaving himself and he just keeps eating sugar and he keeps eating sugar and he keeps eating sugar and he doesn't seem to be understanding and he doesn't understand that this is going to lead to consequences which are going to be horrible. Gandhi ji hears, him, her, hears her out and says, Fine, I will give you the magical thing, uh, you know, and come and uh, talk to me after two months. But he's saying, Gandhiji, he loves you. So if you were to tell him uh, now, uh, you know, it will do a lot of good if you can talk to him or something. He's saying, no, come to me after two months. So anyways, not knowing what Gandhiji was doing, uh, the woman brings the son back to him after two months. And then uh, Gandhiji looks at the child and says, son, it is not good to eat sugar. Please don't eat sugar because sugar will spoil your health. You love me. And if you really love me, you should reduce your sugar intake. And the child apparently I'm told stopped eating sugar. But the mother got very intrigued. At some point of time, she went and asked Gandhiji if it was such a small five minute spill, why did you not tell him earlier? I think the problem was that when you told me to tell him I was myself eating sugar. 
And therefore, if I was indulging in eating of sugar out of uh, uh, the required levels, then how could I be telling someone not to eat sugar? So walking the talk, creating an inspiration goes much beyond just using your aura, but to demonstrate your worthiness. That's what inspiration is about creating that cutting edge differential, which makes a person believe in you that you will handhold and help him jump higher and higher targets of life. This is what I thought I will share with you, uh, you know, my 15 doodles on inspiration. These doodles have come at different, different points of time uh, during the last two years. I just cull them out together and put them together in a story narrative format to be able to talk to you about uh, my concept of what is esoteric leadership. And this time the focus was on inspirational leadership. So I thought I'll thank you for patiently listening to me uh, for the last what around, uh, you know, 4.30 to now. So I'm leaving one and a half hours. So if there are any questions, please uh, certainly ask me. Rupali, if you have been seeing the box because I've been talking and I've been so focused on talking that I am not focused on the questions, but if you could read out Rupali some of these questions, or allow people to ask questions, I'll be comfortable. Sure, sure. So keeping in mind the paucity of time, we have, we can still take about two, three comments or questions, which are already there in the chat box. So we have um, one second. We have Aditya saying, so sometimes leaders throw challenges on us, make things intentionally difficult to check our resilience, which may be sometimes misunderstood as, mo as demotivational. So any specific comments on this? Like he's looking for your comment on this. So Aditya, open out your uh, mic, unmute yourself, talk to me. Uh, according to you, after what you heard is your leader, not sometimes, but such a leader that you have experienced, is he a palliative leader or a toxic leader? Aditya? Hi Aditya, you can unmute yourself. We have given the permissions. All right, uh, if Aditya is not speaking up, let me still nonetheless answer the question. So this is a sign of an uh, absolutely uh, toxic leader. Why toxic leader? Why should a leader want to test you out whether you have resilience or not? All right, if you have resilience, you will indicate that resilience. He is not going to be taking a test of your resilience. Sometimes toxic leaders, as I tell you, they wear the garb of a palliative leader. All right. So to the world, they wear this, uh, you know, uh, uh, uniform and pretend that they are great motivators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know what? That action was actually to test him. Actually, he wants the person to fail. All right. So that then he can take the net results of the failure. And I know so many people in a large organization we were consulting. The leader was taking decisions to ensure that people were failing. And then they would ask him, "Why did you do that? Why did you not give them the resources when you had the resources? Why did you not give them?" No, you know, actually I was trying to check it out whether, you know, he had the resilience to fight back and come to me and things like that. Why were you testing him out? Because that was hardly a thing to be tested. All right. So oftentimes remember that palliative leaders don't do these kind of testing. It is the toxic leaders who are wearing palliative garbs on the outside who indulge in such kind of practices. Thank you, Adil. We have another comment from Nilofa. So she is asking, Please, would you share industry examples of palliative leaders? Uh, Asim Premji, just immediately, not that I mean Ratan Tata. And so many others that down the line, as I tell you that, why do we keep looking up only to those guys? Within other organizations, if we really search for Nilufar, we are certainly going to experience on the breathing track of our organizations, leaders who have inspired their teams to achieve targets which otherwise seem very difficult. I used to be uh, in Coca-Cola when the pesticide issue came. We were running at the peak of it at 120% of our performance. When the pesticide issue hit us, we came down to 18% of our sales. But there was an inspirational leader, really an inspirational leader who got the team together and says, okay, fine. We have been hit by this reality. How do we fight back? How do we gain our energies? And how do we show to the world that our product is not as contaminated as a certain set of people are hell bound for 
uh, hidden agendas trying to prove and we succeeded in getting back the numbers. But on, if you start looking within your organ, which is what I'm saying, every leader's job is to search for the palliative leaders in the organization. I believe, I believe with my experience that each one of us has been blessed by a magical element hidden in us, which has the capacity to create inspiration. Promising, every mother inspires the son. Every child is inspired by the parent. Each one of us has this hidden element within us, which has the potential to positively motivate people. Unfortunately, due to lack of self-belief, we have not been able to nurture that potential hidden element within us, as a result of which we believe that we cannot be as motivational as those big guys in those lovely frames, which are wall hangings in our houses. But if each one of us goes around looking with a magnifying glass to highlight the narrative stories of successful people and then to magnify them as the leaders, I promise you, you could be that palliative leader yourself. Thank you, Adil. Um, we have a next question from Roshan. Roshan is asking that what are the vulnerabilities of an inspirational leader? The beauty, Roshan, is that inspirational leaders are never vulnerable. They are so confident that they are never vulnerable. The moment a leader is vulnerable, which means he worries that someone else will take over him. He worries that, you know, he's expecting that person to do things which he's not capable of. That is the maturity of the inspirational leader. A inspirational leader at a very... Uh, uh, a logical level understands the challenges before him. But in his spirit and mind, he believes that those challenges are easily surmountable and therefore inspires people to do it. And then he's not worried that if he succeeds, can a coach not train his person to do a higher jump than what he has done for fear that his records will be overtaken if the uh, mentee was to jump higher than him? If every leader who starts thinking like that, then he's a toxic leader. Well, inspirational leader is never worried about vulnerabilities. That is what makes an inspiration. I so don't know if that answered your question, Roshan. Thank you, Adil. Okay. <clears throat> so we close this with the with you know our last question from Pratima, which is: Would you say that for a woman, it is tougher to be palliative leader despite all the attempts? Why? Can someone explain me why? Pratima, do you want to unmute yourself and do, would you like to elaborate on your question? Why should it be difficult for a woman to be a palliative leader? Why? Right? I mean, you mean to say that women are actually toxic leaders? I would absolutely disagree. I have in my career worked with three leaders who I reported into who were women, two in uh, America and one in India. And I never found them to be... Uh, Toxic enemies. In fact, they were all very, very palliative. They encouraged me, they motivated me, they handheld me, they helped me jump higher. I don't think so. I don't agree with you. Okay, uh, so we have a comment. I'm going to take that. And there's a very interesting question by Cooper. So we'll close with that for sure this time. So the comment from Rajan is um, resonating with words of Gandhiji. He said, be the change you want to see. If I don't want to be a toxic manager, let me be the opposite of it. Thanks, Dr. Adil Malia for the session. Thank and we you. have a closing question from Cooper, which is, um, like you said, very much focused on the action. So he is asking, how can you change a toxic leader to make him more palliative? All right. So actually, uh Toxic leader needs a palliative leader above him to be able to do that, all right? So he requires a certain amount of serious coaching, a certain amount of serious talking into, putting him into a certain kind of a behavioral lab, uh, giving him a mirror to reflect on how his behaviors are being perceived by people. Because toxic leaders in their minds also, they tell so many lies to themselves that even in their minds, they start believing that they are actually palliative leaders. They don't believe the 
toxic leaders don't believe they are toxic. In their minds, they believe they are palliative and others are toxic. Therefore, they need to be given a mirror to see their behaviors, to be able to reflect how their behaviors are having negative impact. And once they realize this, that is when they come out of their shells and that is where you handhold them. And that's exactly what the inspirational coach or inspirational leader above them, which is what we call positive coaching, all right? So that is what we call positive coaching which helps such kind of behavioral toxic leaders to start becoming palliative over a period of time. Thank you, Adil, for this inspirational session. And thank you to all the audiences for joining in. We, from LNOD Roundtable, we look forward to seeing you all again on our session on 27th August. We have shared the registration link in the chat box. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure with me.